Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Episcopal Parish's discussion of how to read the Bible. Today we are beginning part two of our discussion, which is paying attention to our literary context. We'll be covering literary context for two weeks. This is the first of those two sessions. To get into literary context, Think about your favorite Bible story. Why is it your favorite Bible story? Are there things in that story that are particularly meaningful, particularly exciting, uh, particularly funny? Are there certain things about the biblical passage that you thought about that bring meaning to your life, or maybe have brought meaning to your life at specific moments? Perhaps a moment of tragedy or a moment of triumph. There are many, many, many Bible stories within Holy Scripture that have transcended their meaning and that have spoken to us presently, not just in times past. But I would wager that there are certain stories in Scripture that maybe you find less than inspiring. Or maybe you find some stories in Scripture that maybe don't really have a whole bunch to say to your current context. Or maybe even better yet, there are certain stories in Scripture you just haven't heard. Because guess what? There are 66 books in the, new, uh, in the Bible that we have. Lots of them are long and it takes time to read them. But there are some Bible stories that nonetheless are seldom read and yet very, very strange when you actually read them. I'll share my own. One of the things that I really enjoy about the Old Testament is that there are all kinds of really, really fascinating stories that are in there. But there is one particular story that is, I think, two or three verses long. And it's a very strange story. It's about the prophet Elisha. The prophet Elisha is going along this road. Now the prophet Elisha is a prophet that is um, in the line of Elijah. And you can find this story in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2. And the entirety of the story reads as follows. As Elisha was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him, Get out of here, Baldy. They said, Get out of here, Baldy. And he turned around, looked upon them, and called down a curse upon them in the name of the Lord. And then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. That's it. That's the whole story. Have you heard that story before? Many people haven't, some people have, but you might wonder, what does that have to say to me today? Well, that is sometimes how we read the Bible, is we try to read in, how is God speaking to me today? How is God telling me to live my life today? What word does God have to say to me? Because of course this is the Holy Scripture, this is the Word of God, but in paying attention to Holy Scripture. Not all stories in Holy Scripture are meant for you. In fact, one of the things we have to pay attention to in literary context is that these stories were written at a very different point in time from where we are right now, for potentially very different reasons, to a very different people. One of the things we have to pay attention to when we get into literary context is being very careful about recognizing the Bible that we have in its literary context is very, very different from what we can expect in our modern literary English-speaking context. Something to perhaps show this most specifically is the fact that Holy Scripture is not written originally in English. 
This can be shown very clearly in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, written in Hebrew, and in fact the Hebrew that you're seeing right now is actually not exactly the Hebrew that would have been written in Genesis because it would be an old version of the Hebrew, Hebrew language. This is a more modern version. This is taken from what's called the Masoretic Text, which is, I believe, an 8th century text that has reliable Hebrew in it. But notice how we read this text. I'm going to read it for you, and you tell me if it gets anything across. Barashith, bara, Elohim, Ed, Hasha, Hashamayim, Va'ed, Ha'eretz. That do anything for you? <laughs> well, obviously, I'm not reading in English, right? I'm reading in Hebrew. Bad pronunciations and all. I can't uh, rid myself of my accent, unfortunately. But something else to notice about Hebrew is that you read it from the right to the left, not from the left to the right. You read it backwards in comparison to how you normally do, and if you look in there, there's nothing resembling anything like the alphabet that we have right now for English. The Bible was written at a different time, in a different language, in a different culture, at a far different time than we read it modernly. Literarily, we have to recognize that even the language that is written in is vastly different than what we have. Or take, for example, the New Testament, written in what's called Koine Greek. At least large portions of it are written in Koine Greek. You also have bits of Syriac. You also have another language called Aramaic. Jesus actually very possibly could have spoken, well, it's, it's, it's high possibility that Jesus spoke largely in Aramaic. Aramaic is a language that was very, very common throughout most of history, really until the turn of the Middle Ages, until, it's, until it started dying out. But we also still have pieces of the New Testament in Aramaic, because if you've seen the parentheses in certain things that Jesus said, you'll notice that there are bits that are preserved in Aramaic. But the writing of the New Testament is in Koine Greek. Let's take a look at a very similar scripture to Genesis chapter 1, which is the Gospel of John chapter 1, which begins in a very similar way. En archi, en ahologos, kai hologos, en proston theon, kai theos, and ton logos. Again, that do anything for you? <laughs> it's not written in English. And it is actually written, it predates the English that we use today. English as we know it right now didn't really come into our own understanding or vocabulary until way, 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 way later than what this was written in. The book of Genesis is, of course, written at least 1,500 or 1,000 years before the time of Christ. And the book of First John, or the book of the Gospel of John, is written after Jesus' witness, witnesses wrote down these things of his resurrection. The Gospel of John is probably the latest gospel we have, probably dating to about the 80s or 90s AD. But nonetheless, it is written in a different language. And therefore, literarily, we have to be keyed in that the writers of the Bible are not English thinkers. We're English thinkers. And in order to get at the importance of this, we have to even think about the ways that we use language in English is just not the way that these cultures use language. And it's not the way these cultures think either as it comes to linguistics. And that creates a lot 
of really fascinating issues. But the thing is, is that this is not unique to the Bible. Take, for example, any kind of writing that has to do with different characters and different kinds of script. This is very common in Japanese, in Korean, in Chinese. They write using a different kind of script, even. It's not a sequential language that reads this way. In fact, the language in which they write in uses completely different kinds of characters. It's a completely different writing system. This is why Mandarin Chinese is uh, considered to be one of the hardest languages to learn in the entire world, even though it is a very common, very widely used uh, language, especially as it comes to commerce. But even recognizing the differences in translation between these two things, because that's the next thing about literary context. When we read it in our English, there is a reason why there is a proliferation of English translations of the Bible. It is because all translation is an attempt at an interpretation. There is not one English translation that is not an interpretation of the committee or of the person's own interpretation of what the Bible is saying. Every single interpretation that is made of the Bible into English has made certain choices as to how to translate it. And you can see this very clearly if you look at different translations of the Bible. Like, for example, one that is very commonly used within the Episcopal Church is something called the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. Compare the New Revised Standard Version with something called the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. And you will see incredible differences in syntax, semantics, Syntax basically means the kinds of words we choose. Semantics is the order and the logic and the way that they're employed. The NRSV flows better than the NASB does. The reason why, as one of my uh, professors once uh, very famously quoted, um, the NASB is the English translation that, as his own words would say, is so close to the original Greek, it's bad English. It's hard to read the NASB in our common English language. It is hard to do because it's just not the way we speak. Well, guess what? It's not the way Greek was spoken either. And we shouldn't expect it to be that way. And in fact, it's perfectly fine for it to be that way. And the reason why literary context is so important for how we read the Bible is that we cannot expect what the Bible says in its original language, in its original context, to mean exactly the same thing when it comes to us in our English language. There are various examples of how we get at this particular point, but think of phraseology. Um, something that we like to do a lot in the English language is pun. A pun is using language that means something in a way that clearly in its context means something else. It's like a pun, like a pine tree. Um, you can imagine a, an imaginary uh, love poem that says, when I looked at this pine tree, I pined for you. Obviously in the way that I'm using this in English is that I'm making a pun off of the name of another English name. So pine, and to pine for someone is spelled the same way, but they mean different things. In fact, there's a word in English that uh, describes exactly what this is. Same kinds of things exist in different languages, except when we don't speak the language, we don't recognize that. When you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, you have prophets that the Lord speaks to in puns. Like, for example, the time when the Lord speaks about a plumb line in one of the prophets. And he says, what do you see? The response of the prophet is, I see a plumb line. And then the Lord goes on this seemingly unrelated um, quote about uh, what the plumb line is supposed to be for something. But if we don't have the original Hebrew in front of us, 
we don't realize that the plumb line and the word that, that the Lord is using as a prophetic message to Israel and to Judah is the exact same sounding word, except it means completely different things. That's called punning, and that's a literary device in which meaning is communicated. That's one way that language is sometimes used, but we miss it if we don't understand that the Bible's not written in English. There are some things that make no sense if we don't pay attention close enough. But there's also another way in which literary context is important, and it is that the way that we understand story functioning within the Bible how do we interpret the story of the uh, second kings when a bunch of boys make fun of Elisha for being bald and Elisha calls down a curse upon them and bears come out of the woods and maul them? What are we supposed to make of that as a self-contained story, right? The rest of the book of second kings doesn't really have much to say about that. Jesus obviously didn't say anything about that. We'd probably have this, uh, this more widely understood. But nonetheless, there are certain stories in Scripture that we just don't bring up very often. That's one of them right there. But there are also other stories that we do know very well, right? We do know the story of the book of Genesis describing the creation of humanity. Adam and Eve. Even if you don't know the full story, you undoubtedly have at least known part of it by cultural prevalence of this within the U.S. Adam and Eve, whenever you bring up something like that, has a certain context within our 21st century that some people understand. The liberation of the people of Egypt, right? When the Israelites came up out of Egypt and they were delivered by passing through the Red Sea when the Lord divided the waters on either side. There's some cultural understanding as to what that means. The story of Joseph and his, as one particular interpretation of this, his amazing Technicolor dream coat. But the, the story of Joseph, who had this beautiful robe that was given to him by his father who was then sold into slavery in Egypt and then he becomes such an important official in Egypt that when his brothers come to him during the famine they don't recognize him because they sold him into Egypt and of course you can read the rest of the story to find out how that works but we have certain stories that we do know and in fact we have certain stories that in the New Testament are brought in as important interpretive literary devices to understand Jesus himself. For example, Jesus actually says in the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 24, when he is on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection and these two disciples don't recognize him, Jesus tells them, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the things concerning himself. The story of Moses and the prophets have something directly to do with Jesus. And in fact, it's so important that this is the case that Jesus explains to them that the Old Testament has everything to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with the coming of the Messiah that the Messiah had to suffer, that the Messiah would rise on the third day, and that, as Jesus would say in the Gospel of John, you would know that I am from God because Moses spoke of me. So literarily, the Bible is a bunch of stories, collected stories, and it is a unified story. It is both a collection of historical record, of fantastical record, of poetry, of writing, of prophecy, of gospel, of letter, all of these various things. They're, they're a collection of stories, but they also are a unified story. It's not an either or, it's both and in this case. And the reason why it's important to hold this distinction 
and the unity together is because it influences the way we read Holy Scripture. Take, for example, if you were to go and read poetry by Robert Frost, and Robert Frost, who was a wonderful poet in and of himself, or you were to go read Emily Dickinson, historically great poet, one of the things that you'll notice literarily about them is that they use language in ways that you wouldn't expect in a history book, right? You wouldn't expect to go to your high school or college history class textbook, pull out and expect to find it written in a poetic verse. It's just not the way that we write history. History is written very um, systematically, very um, carefully, examining, a good history book will examine the claims that it makes historically, such as, you know, this happened on this day, this happened on this day, but then they explore, here are the factors that arose to this happening, here are the various things that go around it. But these are dealing with historical facts, right? Historical facts that we glean from our sources. Poetry is not written that way. In fact, poetry is not necessarily written in fact. Poetry, in a lot of ways, is written in a different kind of literary fashion. Guess what? The Bible has those same literary distinctions between them. Have you ever been in a discussion or a debate as to whether the Bible should be taken literally or otherwise. There is a common misconception that if you're a true biblical believer, you have to believe literally what the Bible says. When in fact, even those who claim that do not do that because they recognize that you have to understand genre carefully. To take the Psalms literally when it says he uh, that when it says in the Psalms that the Lord has made the earth so sure that it cannot be moved, therefore the earth cannot move. Guess what was a primary proof text by the church when Copernicus and Galileo, by their observation of the physical universe, said that the sun, the Helios, must be the center of our solar system and that the Earth rotates in an, around it in an ellipsis. It was that psalm verse. Guess what? The psalms were not written to be a scientific journal. They were written to be poetry that is transcending the simple meaning of the words they're using. In fact, the poetry that they're using assumes a certain cosmological understanding of the universe that we do not have now. We'll get into that in historical context, but in literary context, we just have to understand poetry is not written to be history. It's written to be an explanatory in a very wonderful way of the love of God for the world, the power of God over creation. Not everything in the Psalms is meant to be a scientific fact. In fact, in poetry in general, very few poets that come together to write their poetry are in any way concerned with trying to write a history of something. Now, they might be trying to give an interpretive interpretation of a history, that's fine, but the genre of the text you're reading is just as important an insight into how to read it as the text itself recognizing that when we read the book of 2 Kings, we're reading a history. So the writer of 2 Kings is writing a history. They are writing about real events, about real things that happened, about real occurrences, and when they do so, they're writing in a way that is trying to be historically accurate in their records. That is very different from when St. Paul, 
or St. John or St. James write letters in the New Testament. St. James is not writing a history, he's writing an exhortation to a small house church. St. Paul is writing to his church plants and encouraging them, giving them pastoral letters, and giving them an insight into how to live for Christ. Paul uses all kinds of different ways of communicating the gospel in the letters that is just not written like a history. But likewise, Paul also isn't all the time writing poetry. Paul certainly has a lot of hymnody that he uses, but Paul doesn't use, uh, uh, Paul doesn't use poetry all the time. Paul writes about specific things. He writes about specific things that happen in the churches, about specific quarrels that are happening in the churches. Paul writes in the context of trying to figure out how Jews and Gentiles can live together in harmony in the church, how both Jews and Gentiles are called by Jesus, and that they are both supposed to be one body. That's a, a huge portion of Paul's literary context. And in that way, he's writing for a specific purpose. Likewise, the Psalms do the same thing, the histories do the same thing, the Gospels do the same thing. And so when you read the Bible, notice a couple things. Number one, we must pay attention to the fact that we are reading something that's not written in our English language originally. And we have to recognize that literarily, translators who are translating our Holy Scriptures are doing the best they possibly can. But we also have to recognize that the translation of the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic or the Syriac into English is an interpretation in and of itself. And it's an interpretation that nonetheless we have to recognize is not originally what the Bible was written in. Of course, thank goodness, because, you know, very few of us are going to be able to sit down and read Greek just off the top of our heads. Probably even fewer of us are going to be able to be, sit down and read Hebrew just off the top of our heads. But nonetheless, we have to recognize that the Bible was not written in our English language. It was written in the language of the people at the time of writing. And therefore, because it's written that way, we have to understand that the language use is going to be different than English. But that's okay. We just have to be aware of that. When you come, come across a passage that doesn't seem to make any sense, and the translation you're reading doesn't seem to make any sense of this, guess what? Lots of wonderful tools for interpretation are available on the internet. In fact, one of the ones I really enjoy using is a website called blueletterbible.org has all kinds of really good tools for examine, uh, examining exactly what's going on in the sentence. Has links to all kinds of different translations. Another one that's really good is Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway, you can actually have side-by-side -side translations to see the differences between the two. It's actually really interesting whenever you run across a passage that doesn't seem to make any sense, just put them side-by-side, -side, see what they say. But the other thing, friends, recognize the genre you're reading. Am I reading a history? Am I reading a gospel? Am I reading a letter? Am I reading poetry? And let that guide you in the way that you need to understand how the scriptures are, are written. Nothing wrong with that, friends. Just recognize your literary context because that will give you an insight into how to read and understand and give you a little bit of an insight into the beginning steps of the interpretation that you need to be listening for in the 21st century. Thank you so much for joining for the Literary Context Part 1. Literary Context Part 2 will be next week in which we will continue talking about ways that we need to recognize literary context within the Holy Scriptures and within our own context as well. Until then, friends, God bless you, stay safe, and may you go in the presence of Christ.